What's up? JSON in five minutes or less, here we go. So first, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and its textbook definition is a lightweight data interchange format, primarily for the storage of data and the exchange of data between clients and servers. So for the storage side of it, you might store data in a JSON file, and that's pretty good because it's lightweight, meaning it's not gonna take a ton of space, and it's also human readable. If you look at this right here, this is an example JSON document, it's, it's fairly human readable. It's key value pairs, and it's, it's pretty obvious what everything is. As far as the client server piece, it basically means that if you're integrating with somebody's API, you would probably send them JSON as a request body, and then their API would likely respond with JSON as the response body. So why does JSON even need to exist? Well, it's a replacement primarily for something called XML, which we'll talk a little bit about later. JSON is more descriptive, it is smaller, and it's a lot more explicit as to what it's storing. And again, we'll talk about more about that later. Let's talk a little bit about JSON syntax. So if you're already a JavaScript developer, all JSON is valid JavaScript. However, not all JavaScript is valid JSON. The primary differences between JSON and JavaScript objects, native objects, is that JSON, you have to quote your keys, have to, and you have to use double quotes, it can't be single quotes, and then you cannot have a trailing comma. And what I mean by trailing comma is on a list of items. So here in array, you see it's item one comma item two. So if this were a normal native JavaScript object, you could put a second comma here and that would be perfectly valid. But because it's JSON, that's invalid. The other difference is JavaScript has more complex types and not all those will work in JSON. Like you can't put functions in JSON. So for non-JavaScript developers, JSON is simply a list of key value pairs. So you have the key, which is double quoted, you have a colon, and then you have some data type. So JSON supports a bunch of data types, it supports strings, integers, floats, null, booleans, true, false, other objects, and then arrays. JSON makes it quite easy to create hierarchical data. And what that means is I can take this entire object and I can paste it as the value of another object. So I could paste that right here. So now we have an object within an object. And because of this, you can go infinitely nested as much as you want. That's necessary to represent the data you want to represent. So we talked briefly about how JSON is lightweight and preferable over XML. So let's talk a bit more why it's the case. So on the left-hand side, we have JSON. On the right-hand side, we have the equivalent XML. And probably the first thing you notice is that everything on the right-hand side is a string. Even the float is 10.2, except this is read as a string. Another big problem with XML is arrays are ambiguous. So with JSON, an array is pretty obvious. It starts with square brackets and has a number of items inside it. With XML, you do array and then you do one or more items. The problem is when you have something like this, this is obvious that it's an array because it's an array element and then it has multiple of the same named item elements inside it. So it's obvious to a XML parser that this is an array. But what if I delete one of the items? Now, is it an array of one item, or is it a property called array, or sorry, an element called array with an element called item in it? Now, anyone watching this who has ever used XML is saying, engineer man, obviously there's XML schemas and that solves the whole problem. And you are absolutely right. XML schemas do define that array would be an array. That way, you know, you can look at the schema and then you can parse the XML and say, okay, well, I know this is an array, so this means this is, you know, an item that's inside that array. The problem is not every response provides a schema. And so you sometimes have to just guess. And even web services that do provide schemas, you still have to consume that schema and apply it to this XML document. And it's just more cumbersome. Whereas JSON just defines it up front. Finally, let's talk about a couple of practical use cases for JSON. So the primary place you're gonna see JSON is in web services, RESTful APIs, or just normal APIs. So if you'd like to integrate with Coinbase or Twitter or any other web service out there, you can almost guarantee that you're going to have to send them JSON. And then as a response, they're going to send you JSON back. And then depending on the programming language that you use, you'll have to parse that JSON and every programming language pretty much on the planet has a way of doing so. And the second popular use case for JSON would be something like configuration files. So take VS Code, for instance. If I open up the settings file for VS Code, my, my personal settings file, you can see that it's all in JSON. You can see also that it's very human readable. So, you know, if I wanted to change the tab size for Docker Compose files, I could do so here. It would be pretty obvious that I could set this to a two or a four or an eight or whatever I want. So just to summarize, JSON is more lightweight than XML. It's less cumbersome than XML. You can use it for configuration files. You can use it for APIs and a variety of other uses. 
And if you're one of the unlucky people who come across an API that is still using XML, just cringe briefly and then let them know they should probably use JSON. And that's it for the video. Hopefully this helped you get up to speed on JSON. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below in the comments. As always, thanks a lot for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you on a future video. See you later.